Welcome to Single Malt History with Gareth Russell, pouring out your serving of pure, distilled, intoxicating, and occasionally delicious history. Hello and good morning from a day by turns inclement then beautiful here in County Down. By way of an example, I'm recording this preamble looking out over fields from the back of my family home that look sun-kissed and golden like a country life ad or transitional shot for Lark Rise from Candleford, yet right above them are skies that look like Sauron is having a really bad day. I'm currently reading Jane Ridley's biography of King George V. It's early days, but I am loving it so far. Uh, It had rave reviews. And since we last spoke, uh, is that the right word? I have finished two novels, or a novel and a series, uh, to be, I suppose, more precise. The novel was Elizabeth Fremantle's The Poison Bed, inspired by the real-life death in custody of an English diplomat in 1613. I'm not really sure how you pull off a genuinely surprising, brilliant plot twist in a work of historical fiction, particularly something that's been you know, known about since 1613, but The Poison Bed did it. Without giving too much away, it moves with the pace of a thriller, I think. I mean, I'm tr- I don't have the book in front of me, but I think one of the um, quotes in the cover had compared it to like a historical Gone Girl. And there is, I mean, it genuinely does have this um, really fresh quality to it of of, um, psychological sleight of hand Uh, and it takes you through the labyrinth of King James I's court and I think the storyline is just like a fantastic exploration of gaslighting. Historically sharp, psychologically plausible, I really enjoyed The Poison Bed. And I finished Alice Oseman's novella Nick and Charlie, the sequel to the Heartstopper series. Season one of the TV adaptation just aired on Netflix, starring Joe Locke, Kit Connor and Olivia Coleman. A romance set in a modern British high school, Heartstopper is based on a series of uh, novels and comics. I loved it, I have to say. Um, It's odd, in a way, how I reacted to it. I I loved watching it, um, sort of, and it stayed with me afterwards. Uh, At the distance of well over a decade, it did feel strange to remember things that, in my own life, that the, that the, series talks about um and have the the memories uh, memories that you, you haven't forgotten but you just aren't thinking about they're sort of at the back of the wardrobe um sort of jogged by this i mean it's exquisitely sensitive heart stopper but it's also really funny it's never sanctimonious or, or preachy without going into too much detail personal and plot uh i dealt with a few of the things which the character of Charlie Spring experiences. And it was a very positive kind of, you know, emotion to see how these storylines were portrayed in the books. Usman has done a brilliant job with that and her characters. Um, it, 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 I, have to, I have to say, as much as there is um, serious subject matter in it, it is very funny and like Becky Albertalli's novel, Simon vs. the Homo Sapiens Agenda, which inspired the movie Love, Simon, the Heartstopper series is I mean, its a very joyously hopeful series of books, and it wears that hopefulness, that lack of cynicism, with pride. I loved it. My only regret, if that's the right word, was how much I wish it had been around when I was in high school. Uh, it felt, I said it stayed with me afterwards, and I'm trying to describe that <laughs> better. I felt like, and this isn't the right, oh, this isn't the um, perfect turn of phrase, but I felt afterwards that I was slightly mourning time. I felt like I was grieving very mildly for what I hadn't had by virtue of a few years of when I was born. 
and the irrecoverable always makes me sad. I don't. It's something that just presses right <laughs> uh, at my at my core. And you know, there's there's an absolutely. This is this is trying to connect things to history. It, in, the, in a tangential, actually no, not tangential way. There is an absolutely brilliant book. I think it's, I'm nearly certain it's out of print now. Um, but it was written by a journalist, uh, Charles Venevisi. It's called Ex Majesty. And he travelled around in the late 1970s, interviewing everyone who was head of a recently deposed royal family uh, still living in Europe. And I think if memory serves, he interviewed, I'm sure, I hope I don't leave someone out, I think he interviewed the last Tsar of Bulgaria, the King of Romania, the King of Italy, King of Greece, King of Yugoslavia, Crown Prince of Austria, and Crown Prince of Albania. And he interviewed the head of the deposed royal families of Portugal, France, Germany, and Russia. I can't remember when exactly Ex Majesty came out. It, it's a narrow window. It was definitely after the restoration of the Spanish monarchy and before the collapse of the Iranian, because he mentions the Shah still being on the throne. So what does that say between 1977 and 79? That's 1978, let's say. Anyway, at the end, um, Fenevisi has this beautiful chapter and it's much more personal and he talks about what monarchism is and how in austria particularly which is where his family were from he talks about how in austria monarchism isn't a movement it's a mood a mood that people feel at sunset I'm butchering the way he says it. It's very poetic and beautiful. I might actually do a podcast episode on this now that I'm saying it all out loud because I think it's it's what an idea and you've and you've gotten all these people to go uh, on the record. But he he talks about how he feels monarchism in places like Austria has almost become an argument with time. And then he reflects on life and how sometimes we grieve time, what wasn't, rather than what was. And he tells a story about two high school friends of his, former sweethearts, who meet once a year. And for one day, they meet in a hotel room, and for one day, they pretend life was something different for them and is going to be something different, that they're still 18, that the world is ahead of them, that they're still the people who fell in love with each other and that they'll make different choices. And on a micro scale, that's how I felt a little in regards Heartstopper. It made me sad afterwards because of what wasn't. Not anything to do with the writing in a bad way. It's just such a well done story. And even by virtue of its existence, that it stirred up a sadness for what never was. And given the time I grew up and where I grew up, never could have been. So it's it's interesting. And it's wonderful that it's in print now. Um, it's interesting, he says. <laughs> it's... Um, it's, it is. Uh, also, on a lighter note, whoever did the casting of Yasmin Finney as the character of L and William Gao as Taozi take a bow because they are pitch perfect. They all are, but I've already mentioned um, the others. Um, but those two, I thought, just absolutely fantastic. Moving on, I just reviewed Sarah Churchwell's book, The Wrath to Come. I think that's in the Times, the uh, London Times this weekend. I'm still reading Edward Shaw Cross's The Last Emperor of Mexico, very much enjoying it. And I finally finished the photograph captioning and selection for Do Let's Have Another Drink, my biography of the Queen Mother, which is out in October and November, and the audio version of which I have some exciting news about, hopefully for you next week. I have still yet to start Becoming Elizabeth, the new stars series about the early life of Queen Elizabeth I, but I, it is firmly on my list this weekend. Uh, I've seen clips of Romola Gary as Mary Tudor, and she is brilliant. Uh, I, can't, I can't believe I'm this behind. I have been saying I will watch it every weekend um, since June. But on the subject of Elizabeth I, that brings us neatly by way of a segue to today's guest. And I 
I'm joined today by Dr. Timothy Ashby, author of the new book, Elizabethan Secret Agent, a biography of 16th century spy, scholar, politician, and saboteur, William Ashby. For someone whose life was to intersect with so many momentous events in Tudor history, William Ashby was born in the suitably dramatic year of 1536, when Henry VIII's second wife, Anne Boleyn, lost her life, and the north of England erupted into an anti-Reformation rebellion called the Pilgrimage of Grace. The Ashbys were at this stage a moderately well-off family in Leicestershire, but those two great events of 1536 would help shape much of young William's later life. He passed his teenage years in an unambiguously pro-Protestant England, as the throne was held by the young but zealous King Edward VI. Everything changed with childless Edward's death and the accession of his Catholic half-sister Mary I in 1553. A year later, 17-year-old William abandoned his studies at Cambridge to flee to Europe in sympathy with the Protestant cause which seems as good as any a point to hand things over to his biographer. Tim, thank you very much for joining us on Single Malt History. Oh, thank you, Gareth. What kind of young man is the William Ashby who quits Peterhouse College, Cambridge, to flee abroad in 1554? Well, like many young contemporaries at Cambridge and Oxford, uh, Ashby went abroad more for adventure than fear of religious persecution after Mary Tudor came to the throne. Um, he enjoyed traveling throughout Europe and indulging in the sensual aspects of the Renaissance. Even though he had no money and his father was landless, he came from a high-status Anglo-Norman family and was adept at exploiting his connections. For example, the Duke of Suffolk, the father of Lady Jane Grey, was uh, probably his sponsor as a fellow commoner at Peterhouse. And what does his time on the continent as a young man do to William in terms of his education and his view of current affairs? Uh, it made him more worldly and, I believe, more tolerant. He perfected his language skills, uh, including French, Italian, and German, and spent two years at the Collège Royal in Paris at a time when French Protestants were being persecuted by the royal government. Ashby acquired both courtly sophistication and personal contacts that proved to be crucial in his future professional work. Uh, he was never particularly religious, unlike Walsman, who was militantly evangelical. Well, uh, that sort of sets us up perfectly. I mean, he William spends a great deal of time with leading Protestant political figures uh, in the magnificently disapproving turn of phrase of a Catholic contemporary. One of William's associates is among the era's chief heresy arcs, but it's that one figure in particular that you mentioned who he's most associated with, and that is Elizabeth I's quote-unquote spy master, Sir Francis Walsingham. What was the relationship between them, and how did it shape the trajectory of William's career? Uh, well, for at least 20 years, um, probably more like a quarter of a century, um, Ashbury is one of Walsingham's most trusted protégés. Sir Francis wrote that he had, quote, declared my mind and pleasure to master Ashby, and towards the end of both men's careers, Walsingham wrote to Ashby expressing, quote, the particular love he had for him. Above all else, um, Walsingham valued loyalty and discretion. And even though Walsingham officially chastised Ashby for attempting to keep King James VI in, in amity with English, uh, the two men were reconciled. And what was the, I mean, what was the world of Elizabethan espionage like? And why was Elizabeth I, England's queen from 1558 to 1603, why did Elizabeth I seem to have been so reliant upon it? Well, the world of espionage 450 years ago was not unlike modern intelligence operations. Now, the great rival European powers depended on agents, double agents, blackmail, cryptography, and, quote, wet ops, murders with weapons and poison. Ashby served as both a freelance intelligencer and a senior agent of influence, recruiting spies across the continent. But Walsingham himself was often frustrated with Elizabeth for ignoring his intelligence about plots against her life and throne, but it nonetheless probably kept her alive, and the evidence of, Queen, of Mary, Queen of Scots, conspiring against her, eventually persuaded Elizabeth to agree to her cousin's beheading. Well, William is referred to as a gentleman intelligencer for our Listeners, can you give us an idea of, of what that is? Um, yes, Elizabethan gentlemen spies were well-educated, socially connected adventurers who merged espionage and diplomacy. 
Uh, unlike civil servants at the time, they weren't paid salaries, only expenses, but were financially re rewarded with valuable leases and revenues from properties of Catholic recusants expropriated by the crown. Ashby was also rewarded um, by being made an, a member of parliament twice. And he, in his career serving Elizabeth in diplomacy and espionage, he travels widely. We know he was at the Siege of La Rochelle in 1573. We know he met the Habsburg Emperor Rudolf II in 1581. Were there any journeys or expeditions of his which you find particularly fascinating? Well, actually, all the ones that we know about, I'm sure that there are many we don't know about, um, are, in, are fascinating. Uh, Ashby took part in numerous intelligence missions and service as a courier, including a dangerous reconnaissance mission behind enemy lines in the Netherlands in 1578 with the Queen's cousin, George Carey, who was the son of Lord Hunston. Um, we know he fought off Spanish agents trying to kidnap him on the Rhine. Uh, they actually engaged in a sword fight with him. He tried to free another English diplomat held hostage by enemy brigands, and he accompanied Walsingham on a disastrous mission to Scotland in 1583 when the English delegates were cursed by a witch on the payroll of the Scottish government. Well, that makes some diplomatic <laughs> difficulties today seem pretty mild. Uh, in Middle Age, William Ashby received his own ambassadorial brief at, to put it mildly, a difficult time. In 1588, Elizabeth I appoints him the English ambassador to Scotland. It's only been a few months since there were anti-English riots in Edinburgh against Elizabeth I's execution of Scotland's deposed and exiled uh, Mary, Queen of Scots. That she was ex-Queen of Scots was generally forgotten in the airbrushing outrage that greets her execution. Her enemies, um, Elizabeth's enemies, wax apoplectic in a mood of anti-English fury. So Ashby is ambassador to Scotland in that aftermath. And then in the face of the Spanish Armada, what was that stint as ambassador to Scotland like for him? Well, the two previous English ambassadors had fled for their lives. <laughs> so Ash Ashby knew Edinburgh was exceedingly dangerous. He didn't want to give up his parliamentary seat and serve as ambassador, but he was persuaded by Walsingham and accepted the post out of duty and loyalty to, to Sir Francis, as well as, of course, to his queen. And Ashby served as both the queen's representative and as what we would today uh, call the chief of station of the nascent secret intelligence service. Uh, he orchestrated two known black ops missions, including the destruction of the San Juan de Sicilia Armada ship, the famous Tobermory Galleon and the interception at sea of hundreds of Spanish Armada survivors who were murdered by, murdered by Dutch proxies for the English. Ashby grew to empathize with young King James and was respected by the Scottish government. His best friend was Lord John Hamilton, who became the first Marquess of Hamilton. And Ashby was actually godfather to Lord John's son. Privacy, that, I mean, interesting to him as a, a godfather, privacy was not viewed, obviously, the same in the 1500s as it is today. What did you discover about Ashby's private life? Well, from his correspondence and observations by contemporaries, particularly his closest friends, Sir Arthur Throckmorton, who kept a diary in which Ashby features quite, uh, quite heavily, we know that he had a dry sense of humor and exhibited his classical education by liberal use of Latin, Greek, and Italian tags. He was a shrewd observer of people, events, and geographic features, and reflected the generally superior attitude of an Englishman of his class and era towards other nationalities and what he called the lower orders. After he relished philosophical discussions, had a small circle of close friends, and was intensely loyal to friends and family, he was somewhat naive about personal relationships and occasionally melancholy. He was austere in dress and demeanor, but privately enjoyed fine wine, cuisine, and the essential aspects of the Renaissance. And like Walsingham, he was not particularly religious. He lived in a house in Clerkenwell in London and was very upset when it was broken into while he was in Scotland. His possessions were stolen, <laughs> demonstrating that London hasn't changed that much in 430 years. Well, lastly, Tim, on a personal note, what drew you to writing about William Ashby? Well, I knew William Ashby for many years only as an intriguing footnote in early editions of Burke's Landed Gentry from a line of text therein which described him simply as, quote, Queen Elizabeth's ambassador James VI in 1589. I was aware that he was a distant relative, the first cousin of my ancestor, Barbara Ashby of Lowesby in Quinby, Leicestershire. And as I began researching his life and career out of genealogical curiosity, 
I felt a peculiar connection with him due to my personal service in government and law and by living in Edinburgh as a graduate student. Well, Tim, thank you so much for that. I really appreciate it. And I, I think the book uh, is something that fans of the Tudor period will love. Elizabethan Secret Agent, The Untold Story of William Ashby, 1536 to 1593 by Tim Ashby, is out now. You can find out more about it on Dr. Ashby's website, timashbybooks.com. That's timashbybooks, all one word, dot com. My thanks again to our guest and to you for listening. Tune in next week for my episode on the real-life historical inspirations behind Agatha Christie's iconic whodunit murder on the Orient Express. Express.